William Shatner. For William Shatner, Star Trek The Final Frontier was only the beginning. He starred in 17 TV series and guest starred in almost 200. A prolific writer, Shatner's latest book is Star Trek Academy Collision Course. So I got permission to write the book because I'm Captain Kirk and uh, they wanted to be on my good side. And... Collision Course takes us back to the future when James Kirk is just 17. Shatner's mission to boldly seek the great leader inside a teenage rebel. That's what I am attempting to do with the young Kirk. Full of the essence of living and could turn bad because of those characteristics, but channel could be the best. Shatner channels his best stuff onto his website, williamshatner.com, drawing new, young fans without even trying. I, I understand cool and I understand hip, but if you try to be cool and you try to be hip, it's not cool. William Shatner on fame. Do you enjoy being famous? I've never wanted to be, I've never said I want to be famous. I don't, that never, that thought never crosses my mind. I want to be famous. Uh, what I want to do is, is have great, terrific, fun roles to require me to exert myself and, and solve the problem of the role. And, uh, but being famous has never occurred to me. And being famous, wanting to be famous never occurred to me. Being famous generally doesn't come into my my psyche and uh, I you know I see people looking at me and they, oh god I don't want to hope my hair is cool um, or aren't you and I say no I'm not yeah I'm in an airport aren't you a uh, no no I, I I look like him if I were shat would I be here that sort of thing does fame actually annoy you uh, yes I'm annoyed all the time I go around in a state of annoyance much to the annoyance of my wife. <laughs> Why do you believe that interviews are so risky for celebrities? You know, when you uh, ad lib, when you're just talking, the thoughts come slowly, as against acting, where you should get on with it, you know, because there's, you have, an, have to have an energy in the scene, at least in my opinion, uh, and you can be relaxed and laconic, but you've got to get on with it and get to the core of what we're d doing and something happens unless you choose not to do that but but when you're talking and your thoughts aren't organized because you don't know what you're going to say next and whatever comes out of your mouth is going to be heard by a lot of people and you can't think of that because then we get tongue-tied so you just got to let it go uh, that's what experience is worth i think it's just you got to just let it go if you say something untoward uh you hope everybody will forgive you because you don't know what's coming out of your mouth next how do you continue to attract younger fans? I, I understand cool and I understand hip, but if you try to be cool and you try to be hip, it's not cool. What's the trouble with Britney Spears, Lindsay Lohan, and other scandalous young celebrities? Well, what's wrong with them is, is discipline. And they never had it. They were never given, they were ne never taught that you've got to, you know, do your freedom, have your freedom. But in this strange thing of, in, there's never, there's a yin and a yang and in everything. So, yeah, be free and wild and all that's great. Then there's a little box of discipline. You've got to have that thing. So when you're free, you still need to be disciplined. Well, they never were shown that or taught that or have it in their genes. Or well, maybe they do, and we'll we'll get it. They're very young, but you know. From William time, Shatner on acting. Why did you become an actor? Uh, it was magical to this young person in Montreal. Now, <clears throat> I consciously look on television. I look at uh, some of these old black and white films. See if I can, like comfort food. Like remember where I was in the Monkland. Was I in the Monkland Theater when I was? He had to be 13 to get in alone. My mother would take me in and she would leave. I'd be 9, 10. I'd sit there through a double bill looking at the films. And I just grew up on, on, on them all. I'd go 
when I was able to get into the theater and it was like 25 cents, I'd go with 75 cents in my, in my hand. And I'd go uh, to a double bill in the morning, in the early afternoon, another 25 cents, and then late, late afternoon into the evening. I'd go to six movies in a day in downtown Montreal when I was growing up. I, I, I was so much a part of that magic screen. What's the William Shatner problem-solving approach to acting? Uh, there's a great deal of there's a great deal to acting that is entirely how do I you, you can think of it intellectually how do I solve this how do I get this joke how do I how do I make this emotion without being without being obvious how should an actor learn to embrace a role well I try and find the core of everything, core of the story, core of the scene, core of the character, and from this core, these tendrils come out. And it's so you angle, uh, you know, Captain Kirk. If you wanted to go to that popular character, I always saw Captain Kirk as full of awe and wonder. So if you see something, you know, rather than being afraid or angry, whatever, whatever it is, it's holy sh! Look at that. It's a holy moment. Everything. How do you handle conflicts with directors? Well, I mean, if the director says, well, I think it should be loud, and you know, well, I think it should be soft, he says, no, loud. Well, you try it loud because he's, he's the boss. You know, it's his film. If it's a film, it's his film, and you want to do it his way, which sounds right. But directors sometimes don't know. They have a, an idea, but it may be wrong. I mean, they aren't God. And, there, and many directors are willing to be shown that, they're, that they are wrong. On the other hand, you may be wrong. I mean, you just don't know. So you try it their way to see the best of your ability, to see if it works, what, if it's in conflict with what you think. So you try it loud, and you try and invest. Well, I want oh, to do this loud. Well, you've got to give some emotional impact. Well, maybe he, And now you're solving something, and it may bring something to the moment that was never thought of before by trying to solve the problem. Is it true you've been difficult to work with on the set? I'm sure I was, uh, especially when I uh, would not have much respect for the guy who was directing. I mean, uh, some directors come out of production. Uh, you know, they don't understand what acting is, or they don't understand drama. They don't understand pace. Faster. Let's go faster. Pick up the pace. Faster. Faster isn't pace, you know. What's the secret to the longevity of your career? I don't know. I, it's totally luck, uh, certainly not by design. I'm a firm believer in, in, in the chaos theory. And just nothing, everything's chaotic and it just works. Uh, I think that there are parameters of existence, whatever that is, uh, whether it's an acting role, uh, a star, I mean a, 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 a celestial body. Uh, you know, everything has parameters that, in which they can live. And once you exceed uh, those parameters, uh, you cease to exist in that form. What motivates you after 50 years in front of the camera? Acting is a challenge. And I was so sorry when I would hear that Marlon Brando was tired and looked down on actors, on himself. He was so full of self-hatred that it became evident that how much he hated himself the latter part of his life, this wonderful genius actor who was this beautiful man with this great face and great body. And he would denigrate acting all the time. And I never understood that because to me it's, uh, it's, it's noble work, it's entertainment, it's the minstrel, it's the storyteller around the campfire. And, the, and, and if you do it well, it's an unusual skill. And, uh, and performing a part is a lot of problem solving. Do you actually believe actors are a lot like horses? A great show horse has to have form, has to be beautiful, if beauty is one of the criteria, has to be, has to have a talent, uh, has to have, uh, uh, be put together right. Uh, even a horse that uh, isn't beautiful per se needs to have needs to have the beauty of form and function so they have to be put together right 
then they have to have a talent for whatever it is the horse is going to do. And then it has to have what horsemen call heart, but it also means brain. It means trainability. It means it wants to go out and do and do and do. No matter what you do to it, it's going on forward. And, and, uh, and yet it needs to have the ability to, to be disciplined so that going, going forward is going forward and then turning to the left. And if you miss any of those three things, your horse is pretty and, and does, but it's crazy, or your horse is pretty and crazy but doesn't do, or that's the worst, you know. So it's all of that. Well, when that convergence happens and you've got heart and you've got ability and you've got the form, then you have an unusual thing happen in, in, uh, in any world, whether it's the horses or show business. Can you do any celebrity impersonations? Uh, Jimmy Stewart, you know, Jimmy Stewart used to go, uh, 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 or a uh, guy I really uh, worked with was Edward G. Robinson. Edward G. Robinson, and if you look at movies in the 40s and 50s, uh, he always played the bad guy, the gangster. And his thing was, he went, nah, 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 I can't kill you, nah. And so I was working with him, and I said, uh, Eddie, are you, are you aware you go, nah? And he went, I go, nah? And that's what I do. What, what are they doing? I, what is that? Uh, that's not me. I don't think. You know, uh, William Shatner on the Star Trek books. How did you become the author of ten Star Trek novels? This 40-page treatment they turned down, and I turned it into a book. Called it The Return, and it was, became a bestseller. And, um, and from then on, it was like, let's write another book. And then I'd do the, the, the audio part of the book. And, and it got to be kind of a thing we'd do every year or so, uh, a gathering. What inspired you to write Star Trek Academy Collision Course? I went into uh, the management at Paramount, and um, I tried to sell them on an idea that I had had that I called the Academy, and it was the young Kirk and Spock in the Academy, young soldiers, and, and we would follow their adventures, uh, uh, delineating how they became the heroes that they ultimately became. And um, I was in there for an hour, long pitch meeting with the heads of the studio and all. And they finally thought about it and they said, no, that's not the way we want to go. And I took that and turned that into this book. How difficult was it to get approval to write Star Trek Academy Collision Course? So I got permission to write the book because I'm Captain Kirk and uh, they wanted to be on my good side and you have to sign releases on, on stuff that they want to uh, merchandise. and So they wanted to keep me happy. But they didn't want to keep me too happy on this book because, and I'm just guessing at this because nobody ever talked to me about it, I, I think they might have thought this might interfere with the new movie that J.J. Uh, Abrams is doing. And I don't know what his script is. Well, I don't know what his script is. Uh, but I know that it isn't the 17-year-old uh, Jim Kirk and 19-year-old Spock. Were you a lot like young Captain Kirk when you were growing up? I was, I was a rebel. I, was, I hitchhiked around the United States. I, I did two-week canoe trips down waterfalls. I mean, I, I did and have continued to do life-challenging... Is it difficult to develop new Star Trek projects? There was a lot of political stuff. There has been and still is a lot of polit political stuff going on in the Star Trek. You can imagine something that's been alive and uh, and uh, made for Paramount about $2 billion, you can imagine. And several administrations, all of whom, like the government, uh, every four years it seems that the administration at Paramount would change and, and somebody new would come in and then commit the same mistakes that the previous administration had made because there was no s sense of history of what had been accomplished or what steps had been taken. So the same mistakes were repeated time and time again. 
So there's a lot of politics at Star Trek among among the men. At what point did William Shatner truly become Captain James Kirk? At a certain point, the actor takes the words and invests the words with his own personality. So that if you played, in this case, say, Danny Crane, you'd be wonderful uh, in it, but you'd be different from me. And so the writers began to see me performing it and and then started to write for what I was doing, and then I would react to what they were writing, and, and so it became a, a symbiotic thing where we fed off each other, and that's how. William Shatner on Parenting How did you manage fatherhood and success while making the original Star Trek series? I'd rent an RV for the weekend, and uh, I'd work, that was the time of Star Trek, I think, and so the show, we'd film late Friday evening. I'd get out, by that time I had the RV all prepared, skis and everything, and three little kids, three years apart, uh, in the in the thing, and in the RV, and I'd drive up, a six-hour drive, I'd get there, they'd be asleep, I'd put them to bed and I'd drive, and two, three in the morning I'd get to the parking lot and park near the lift and fall into bed and sleep till seven or eight, then I'd make breakfast for them. Then I'd get them all out into the par snowy parking lot, dress them all in all, the boots and the hats and the gloves and the thing, and then I'd get the youngest, finally get the youngest one done last, and she'd get out, and she'd say, I have to go to the bathroom. Then so she'd go back, back, and the others are saying, I want to go skiing. And I'd get all three onto a hill, put them in skis, and deal with them all day and try and ski myself, because I love to ski. And at the end of the day, dinner. Oh, don't forget lunch. We had to all meet for lunch. And then dinner and undress them and get them and put them to bed and amuse them. So my children who have these, in two cases, two kids, in one case, one kid, are saying, how did you do it without help or anything? How did you? We can't, we can't move. I, we can't, I'm not going to go to Mammoth without, without a, a nanny. I'm saying I took three kids up there, and I was a, an actor who was finished working on 10 o'clock Friday night. It was wild. But I never thought of it that way, and fame certainly never entered into it. It was a, a harassed, uh, anguished daddy like so many of us around the country. How did you maintain a relationship with your daughters after they grew up? We've missed because my children now have children of their own, so it's not as on the mark as it used to be, but Sunday dinners, every Sunday used to be with all the children, either at a restaurant or at home. If I had somebody at home who would help me make a meal from time to time. Or go to a restaurant, go to their favorite restaurant. Uh, holidays with my kids. and So we have a lot of memories. What's the secret to being a good parent? I don't know whether you push or you pull or you get out of the way. Uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, and nobody knows because it's an individual thing and so much is conditional. Uh, by that I mean you do what the way you were brought up, basically. Uh, you end up saying to yourself, it's my mother used to do that. What do I, why am I doing that? What's the secret to being a good parent? I don't know whether you push or you pull or you get out of the way. Uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, and nobody knows because it's an individual thing and so much is conditional. Uh, by that I mean you do what the way you were brought up, basically. Uh, you end up saying to yourself, it's my mother used to do that. What do I? William Shatner I? on education. How important was your education? My education is limited really, although I graduated from university, I was so one-sided about drama and acting uh, that uh, the other part of reading the great masters and and uh, learning and Latin or, you know, doing something esoteric, I, d I never did. I was always doing a school musical or something like that, and that's how I got my education. Why did you study business instead of acting? My degree is in business because my father was a businessman, and um, uh, when I left high school, and I, 
I knew by that time what I really loved, but the concept of becoming an actor, I mean, in Montreal, and my family was just, was, would be outlandish, would be like being an adventurer. What's wrong with American education? One of the problems with our school system is it cuts off the curiosity. Uh, yes, all very well, what's the nature of man, but two times two is what? Learn your multiplication tables. To the detriment of... William Shatner, singer-rapper. Is it true you like hip-hop music? I never liked uh, hip-hop music to begin with. And then the more I heard it, and I did one once. I did a hip-hop thing on Julius Caesar. I did. I worked with a hip-hop artist, okay, rated R. I don't know what I was getting myself into, but I thought, wow, this is... Uh, uh, I'll do uh, Friends Roman Countrymen in hip-hop. How did you come up with the rap song, No Tears for Caesar? So I met... <laughs> I haven't told this story in a long time. <laughs> so I met with a rap group. I said, well, let me explain to you what this Shakespeare play was about and, and what this guy was doing, what this guy Mark Anthony was doing over there funeral of his friend who was killed and he, the enemy is all around and he's got to give an eulogy and he and he doesn't know what to do and how is he going to say these words over the body of the man he loved without invoking his own death and death and destruction and it was a very touchy time the guy said I got it I got it no tears for Caesar great title and this artist, this kid off the street, starts writing furious, and I'm looking at this, what he's writing, and he's got words, and he, out oh, in the words, just exactly what I had said about poetry. He, without having studied, I presume, having studied poetry, but having the knowledge, he had the knowledge in his soul, he's writing furiously, and, and we sort of practiced around, the, and some time later, he had written a rap version a friend's Roman and countryman. It goes into No Tears for Caesar. The title of the song was called No Tears for Caesar. How did singer-songwriter Ben Folds help you create your album, Has Been? Ben Folds called about something. I think he called about a performance he was going to come and do in Los Angeles and wanted me to do something with him. And I said, wait a minute, Ben, I want you to produce my record. And these guys said, oh, we'd love to have Ben Folds. And I said, Ben, would you do it? He said, I'd love to do it. And in that moment, the record was born. So when I said to Ben, now what am I going to do? What do I, what, how, what kind of, he said, well, why don't you write some songs and tell the truth? How do you use your acting experience to help write songs? Poetry at its best distills uh, the, the thing you want to say to the minimal number of words. If you can find the essence in a word, if you can say one word, that conveys your meaning. You're doing minimal, minimal work, like an actor does does a lot of stuff in rehearsal, and then gradually, and gradually, he sees that he doesn't need to do all that, and finally, does the thing that conveys everything as simply and as efficiently as possible.